My boy Bill, I will see this named after me. I will. My boy Bill, he'll be tall and as tough as a tree. Will Bill, like a tree he'll grow with his head held high and his feet planted firm on the ground. And you won't see nobody dare to try to boss him or toss him around. No. That's Nicholas Rodriguez singing a song from the musical Carousel. He's playing Billy Bigelow in the current arena stage production of the Rodgers and Hammerstein classic. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. The role of Billy Bigelow is a meaty one for an actor. He dominates the stage, mixing bluster, vulnerability, charm, and brutality. He also sings some of the most beautiful and complicated songs ever written by Rodgers and Hammerstein. It's a part that Nicholas Rodriguez nails in the revival of Carousel directed by Arena Stage Artistic Director Molly Smith. Rodriguez is a favorite actor at Arena Stage, playing characters like Curly in Oklahoma, for which he won a Helen Hayes Award, Freddie Einsford Hill in My Fair Lady, Fabrizio in The Light in the Piazza, and he's appeared in several non-musical plays as well, all of these in the past six years. Rodriguez has also appeared on Broadway in Tarzan and performed in national tours of Jesus Christ Superstar, Evita, and Hair. And that's just skimming the surface of a very accomplished career. Nicholas Rodriguez shines as Billy Bigelow. Gone is the sunny innocence which Nicholas was so good in portraying in Oklahoma's Curly, for example. Billy is a conflicted and complicated character with as much darkness as light. Billy Bigelow, he's the barker at this carousel. It's told to us very early on that he's a drifter. You know, he's done this in Coney Island. He's done it all up and down the main coast. He's a bit of a ladies' man. He's hothead. He falls passionately for this Julie Jordan who works in the mill. Uh, he's a man that fights for what he wants, but he's not always sure what he wants. Uh, so... And he doesn't always make the right decision, unfortunately, like so many of us in life, you know. So he thinks he he has the best intentions, but not necessarily the best plans. You know, just for listeners who might not know, can you briefly summarize the plot of Carousel? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. I mean, because it's such a dense plot. But I always tell people that it's the basic boy meets girl story with a twist. Like I said before, Billy Bigelow, he's the barker of a carousel. And Julie Jordan, they fall in love, and it's a whirlwind courtship that we see on stage and then we jump to five or six weeks later and they're married and you you find out that things might not be so ideal in their marriage you know he's out of work he's drinking too much and it comes out that he hits her so you're dealing with an abusive relationship and shortly thereafter he finds out that he's going to be a father and that you know inspires him to try to get his life together but it doesn't go so well Uh, and then there's a twist you know so without giving away too much of the ending and the it deals with redemption and how we're redeemed, and it's a roller coaster. <laughs> it is indeed. Uh, tell me about the character of Billy Bigelow. It's very much Billy's show. Yes, <laughs> it, it feels like it. It is. I mean, I, I think it is, and I think that that obviously has to be extraordinarily rewarding, but also very, very challenging. How did you prepare? Uh, you know, I prepared. By putting one foot in front of the other, honestly, like not letting myself put the cart before the horse. So it was basically like laying building blocks. And I had known I was going to do it for some time now. Molly Smith, our director, and I have been talking about this one for a while. It's been on my dream list, bucket list for a while. So I started with the nuts and bolts, learning the songs on my own. So that way I can dig into them a little bit deeper as an actor. And then working it step by step, you know, and it really is like doing building blocks. You know, you you have to just kind of do one piece at a time. And I didn't actually meet Betsy Morgan, who plays Julie, until the first day of rehearsal, which, you know, it it sounds odd, but this business is so small that chances are you've met before, you've auditioned or something. And so that was really neat because then you really couldn't start forming that relationship until we started. So I had a full process with her. That's an interesting thing because I, I'm really curious about the rehearsal process. Did you come in 
with a firm take on the character of Billy, or did you let that develop throughout the rehearsal process? I came in with a fair idea of who I thought he was, you know, and I came in knowing the music, but nothing else. You know, some actors like to come in with all their lines learned, and and not me. I I really try to just focus when I get here with the people that I'm going to be working with. That's just how I like to work. But I felt like I had a pretty strong idea of who I thought Billy was. And the first week or so of rehearsal, we just sat around the table and talked. We didn't block any of the scenes. We didn't do any of the choreography, any of the songs. And we just went scene by scene and kind of fleshed it out so that informed the take on it as well. And then, of course, through conversation with Molly and with Betsy and and uh, Sky Maddox, who plays Louise, what that relationship was going to be like. And Louise is Billy's daughter. Exactly. And I had the pleasure of uh, working with Ife Butler, who plays Mrs. Mullen, and knowing in advance that she was cast as well. I think that relationship is very integral hindsight into who Billy is, the different relationships that he has with Mrs. Mullen and with Julie. And Mrs. Mullen owns the carousel. Yes, she's the owner of the carousel, and to some degree owns Billy, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's not stated, but it's hinted at that he's sort of a gigolo. Exactly, exactly. And that's the take that we're, we're going with this, too. So, so all of that like, informs who he is. And I, I think in the beginning, I was so daunted, not by the nuts and bolts of, of the music, and that's its own challenge, and, you know, and the text is its own challenge, but who he is at his core. I think as an actor, you can't... I can't believe that he's a bad guy if I'm going to commit to playing him every night. I have to believe in the good parts, you know, even though he does some bad things. So I was intimidated by the differences between Nicholas and Billy. And I kind of had a little block to it until Molly just said, well, our director said, just start with what's similar. And as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, okay, because there is so much about him that is like me that then I could allow myself into the darker parts. So how are you similar? Well, we're both very passionate. We both are flirtatious. Uh, We both go after what we want. Big dreamers. Love fiercely, love deeply. Yeah, those, those are some of the things I started with. What's wonderful about the character of Billy is how complicated he is. He's charming, so you have to convey charm, but there's this whole other darker side of him as well, and one doesn't negate the other, but you have to be able to present it all. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, too, and, and so fun and fulfilling is, you know, doing it in a city like D.C. where you have a big population of intelligent, educated people, you know, so... Everybody's walking into it with their own opinions, and they're not shy to wait around and tell you afterward, too. <laughs> you know, like, just when we started talking, you saw it at the, the Lincoln Center production in 94, and I had many people that tell me they saw John Raitt do it, and, and everybody's coming in with their own opinion, even if they just know the songs and how this it lives in our American psyche because it's been around for 71 years. So it's really amazing to have the opportunity to put your own stamp on it without even changing any of the text, just bringing who I am as a human being to the same exact material. That's what's so fabulous about theater. Yeah, it really is. It's it's immediate, it's present, it's here, and Mm -hmm. it needs the actor, or it's it's only on a page. And it needs the climate. I mean, you can't ignore that we're doing it when we're doing it with, with this group of diverse ethnic people. You know, this production wouldn't have been done 71 years ago, you know, but it's the same. Text. How many shows have you done here at Arena Stage? I think this is my eighth. We brought Oklahoma back for an eight, a second run, so the seventh production. But Because you've worked here so often, and often with Molly Smith mm-hmm. as the director, I would imagine that gives you a level of comfort. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it gives me the, the comfort to know that I will get the truth. <laughs> you know, there's no hiding when some when you've worked with somebody as intimately as Molly and I have worked together because she knows all your tricks, you know, so she's going to always ask you to dig deeper, go further. It's never one of those relationships that's like, hey, remember that thing you did two shows ago? Put that moment here. Like it's always looking for what you haven't done so far. Or what pocket of your psyche have you not scratched yet? And 
that's what I really like. And if, and if she feels like she's seen it before, she's the first one to tell you. Do you think having that comfort is kind of necessary or important for you to be able to take chances on the stage? It was for me in a role like this, I think. I think because there is so much about Billy that's vulnerable and slash volatile, and because he is a hothead, it was really awesome to know that I was going to be working with people that I completely trusted. And when I say that Billy was the dream role, I mean, this was the dream team I wanted to do it with as well. And at Arena Stage, you know, so Paul Sportelli, our music director, I've worked with twice before now. And Park Ressi, the choreographer, I've worked with twice before now, too. So it's just really awesome to be able to speak that shorthand and to have people know when you need a little something and know when you need to be left alone. You know, it's really great. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. You mentioned Oklahoma because you reopened Arena Stage after it had been closed for its massive and gorgeous renovation. Playing Curly in Oklahoma which is another meaty Rogers and Hammerstein role. Yeah. <laughs> Compare Curly and Billy. Oh, gosh. You know, they're archetypically very... Is that even a word? Archetypically? Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Why they're not? very similar on the page, you know? Like, the, the, the physical requirements and the vocal requirements and the aesthetic requirements are very similar. They took place in a very similar window of time in American history, just in two different places. But... Curly, as much as he rides the open plains, has not seen nearly as much of the world as Billy has, you know? So it's just interesting to have two men that are about the same age who've had completely different experiences in life. And I think a lot of that comes in the preparation and what I think is an actor and what happened to them before we meet them in the world of the play. You perform a lot in D.C. and you perform in regional theaters. And, you know... At the NEA, we look at theater throughout the country, but often in the popular vision, theater is Broadway and Broadway is theater, which means that most of the work that's being done is, is not being discussed frequently. You're out there and performing. What's your sense of the vitality of theater throughout the country? Well, I think it's really great. I mean, I'm fortunate that I get to work in some really vibrant places that have really vibrant thriving theater communities. And I I agree with you that for the average person, you know, they have their pulse on what's going on on Broadway because of things like the Tony Awards and the Grammy Awards. And, you know, you, it's, it's awesome to be going around the country and that emergency room doctors and housewives and school teachers can sing songs from Hamilton. I mean, that's, that's kind of cool. But I think it's, there's also a trickle down effect too with regional theaters, some that people are aware of and some that aren't. Like the, the fact that some great shows start in regional theater and then move to Broadway like Dear Evan Hansen, which next to normal. And people might not be aware that they started in regional theater before moving to Broadway. And then huge Broadway hits, once rights get released, move out to regional theater. So it's kind of cyclical in that way. Yeah, like a revolving door. In exactly. Some ways. Are you at a stage in your career where you don't feel like you have to worry about the next job or is that an occupational hazard (laughs) (laughs) I mean I try not to worry about it I I I don't like to spend a lot of energy worrying about it but it's constantly there (laughs) let's just be for I talked to my agent yesterday and he said uh he said I think I've talked to you more times today than I have in the last three weeks so it's the blessing and the curse of what we do you know you open a show and then you, you might get a day past opening before people say, so what are you doing next? You know, so it's, it's always there. It's always on the forefront. I think another thing, people often overlook how entrepreneurial actors have to be. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're your own business. You're your own brand. You, you know, it's, you're the keeper of your own schedule. And, you know, it's fabulous on one hand and it's frustrating on the other. Yeah. So And terrifying in between. Well, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, you played Nick Chavez in the soap operas, One Life to Live, mm-hmm. which turned out to be a very important role in many ways. Yeah. Tell us about that. It was very fun. You know, it's so funny because most people, they say, oh, that's where I got my start. Actually, I had done a lot of stuff before that, but it was kind of the, the most high profile, I guess, of the time. But it was somebody that was just supposed to be there for just this one three little episode arc 
Uh, he was a gay character. He was a third in this gay love triangle that they were trying to put on ABC, and which was, you know, at the time, new. And the response was great just from the producers, so they just kept writing him and kept writing him. And every week or so, they'd say, can you stick around a little bit longer? And I said, absolutely. But he became, Nick Chavez became a lot of firsts on daytime television. You know, the first it was the first person to propose to somebody of the same sex. I was the head of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance in the fictional town of Landview of our town. You know, there was a gay wedding. There was a hate crime that was really amazing. And shooting it in New York, we didn't even have gay marriage legalized in New York, much less federally at the time. So the fact that ABC was writing it and that I was lucky enough to get to play the character, it was awesome. And because there was no plan originally for Nick his name wasn't even Nick. It was something else. I can't even remember what it was. It was something incredibly waspy. Brian. So not even like Brock or something. Like something incredibly waspy. And I walked into set and they're like, we can't call him that. Let's just, well, he's only here for three episodes. Let's just call him Nick because it was my name and everybody could remember it. And then a couple more episodes later, they were like, well, if you're getting married, you have to have a last name. So this, the character, and they just started writing him with my voice. I mean, because there wasn't really a plan, just a lot of episodes started happening really fast. So it was really fun and really fascinating to do. Soap operas are so, or were, because now there are yeah. so few, but are so important to younger actors, actors as they're yeah. getting a start or, or getting their face out there. I remember being so intimidated because there's no crash course. You show up, you get the job, and you just show up. There's nobody that holds your hand. There's you know, there's no rehearsal process. You just show up and start filming. And I remember being so nervous. And one of the contract actresses who'd been on the show for a while, she walked straight up to me, introduced herself. She's like, oh, my God, you've been on Broadway. I was like, well, here you are. You star on a TV show, you know. So it was just very like, whoosh, I can breathe now. Like, OK. You know, so it was, it was cool. It was a very cool experience. You know, I always think, Working in a soap opera is the equivalent of writing a daily newspaper column. Yeah. There's just no time to be precious. You have to just do it. And for an actor, you know, it's like sometimes you just, you can obsess about, oh, how am I going to say this line? How am I going to do this? But when you're getting a script one day and you shoot it the next day, I was doing, for a good chunk of the time I was on One Life to Live, I was also doing an off-Broadway show called The Toxic Avenger. So, you know, if you would think of being on set from, 7 or 8 a.m. until 5 and then being at the theater at 7 to 11 like you're learning those lines like in the car in between or on the subway or in the dressing room between you know so you're constantly just learning new information where were you raised austin texas did you come from a family that was musical or? um yeah both of my parents played in the band in high school and my dad you know played in the in a little rock, pickup rock and roll band for fun on the side and my grandmother was the choir director at our church, and she was an elementary school music teacher. So to some degree, I mean, music was always part of our life, but nobody, you know, nobody actively pursued it as a profession other than my grandmother, who was a music teacher. What drew you to doing that? Uh, you know, it's kind of a funny story. I mean, I always sang just like around. I just thought everybody did, you know, like our, at church or whatever. But then when I got to high school, my dad was the football coach at my high school, and I had to ride with him to school every morning and uh, got there early for football practice. I didn't play football. And the only other thing that met before school was the show choir. So he's like, well, you got to do something. Go check that out. So I did. And turns out that I could sing and liked it. And that led me to musical theater. Yeah. And where did, where did you train? Where did I get my degrees? Yeah. I went to the University of Texas at Austin and got a bachelor's and a master's in voice. When did you move to New York? I moved there in September of 2001. Oh, that was good timing. Uh, yeah, it was an interesting time. Oh, Lord. How long? September 5th. I went on the road right very shortly after moving there. Yeah. What, what was your first job in New York? My very first job was right after September 11th happened. I got a phone call out of the blue from Harrisburg Opera. The One of the actors that was doing Candide, their production of Candide, pulled out because he didn't want to travel and leave his family. Uh, they started rehearsals, I believe, on the 14th of September and the Kunagonda had done it with me before, so recommended me to the conductor. And You mean you had worked with the actress who exactly. played the role? They offered me the job, so I went very much just to 
product of circumstance. Wow, but that's that. That is was a it. Very nice. Yeah, and after first that, job. it was a very nice job. And I got, after that, I I got this book from a friend of mine. It was called The Business of Acting. It's a, a small little book, and basically it had chapters on how to get an agent, how to write a resume. I mean, little stuff. So I copied the cover letter verbatim and just said, you know, I, I just moved to the city. I just did this job. I'm looking for representation. I went to the drama bookshop and bought a packet of pre-made labels to send to agents for $9.99. And I sent off 50 or 60 cover letters and, and headshots and resumes. And that's how I got my first agent right after that job. So all the things that they say never work somehow happened for me. So I feel very knocking on this wooden table. <laughs> they worked out. You know, there are people who look at musical theater, and obviously I am not one of them, but they see it as as strained and artificial. What is it about musical theater that draws you? Well, I mean, I tend to agree. It can be strained, it can be artificial, but it can also be thrilling. So I think that's when it's really great. And I think there's something so magical about being able to move seamlessly from speech to song. I'm a huge fan of opera, but not everything I have to say needs to be sung. Some things need to be in the case of a musical. So re when you get that right combination, it's just, it's just thrilling, you know? And me as a person, as a human being, I find that I'm not always the best with words. I'm not a great communicator, but I can sometimes read something that, that inspires me. Or this song, you know, so be, being able to do that on stage is sometimes better than how I can communicate to other people. You and Alicia Gamble, who played Lori in Oklahoma, put on a cabaret show here mm -hmm. at Arena Stage, and you've done other cabaret. What set of chops as a performer do you have to bring to a cabaret? Uh, you know, it's 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 similar set of chops as doing a musical or doing a play, but the thing that the biggest difference is that you have to completely bring yourself, you know. And I think that's why I resisted doing it for so long. I, I've always been fascinated by it, not just cabaret, but like solo concert work. I've always loved it, and the the immediacy of interpreting songs. I mean, like I said before, about it's it's the the best form of expression for me that I know how to do. And I think I was so afraid to bring my real self. It's it's so vulnerable because you, it's not somebody else's words in the script. It's or the, not the, Billy Bigelow Exactly. It, it's not a character. It's you. So why am I singing these songs now? But, you know, once I did it, I just got the bug. I got, I got hooked. I just love it so much. How do you set the playlist? Other than the show with Alicia, I did a, my solo show, which I recorded and made my first album. And now I'm getting ready to do another uh, solo show at Signature for a week here in D.C. But the first one, I just started from an advice of a friend of mine who's a big cabaret artist in New York. I just kept a running list of songs that I was drawn to and something that I felt like I had something to say. And then as I started whittling, I was like, well, what do these have in common? For instance, my first show was called The First Time. And all of the songs in that set list had something that was a first in my life, whether it was first kiss, first heartbreak, first Broadway show. And then there, there I was able to write the patter for the show and, and I found the hook into it. It's really fun for me. I like the idea of planning and programming. It's kind of uses all of the tools in my toolbox. You know, I get to dabble with directing, a little with writing, and then arranging how I'm going to do the songs, you know, so that they're personal. So what's the theme for your next show, the one that's going to be at Signature at the end of January? This new show is, is all songs of the 70s. So that's the hook through that one with new new arrangements. I'm turning 40 this year, so I was feeling very nostalgic about the 70s. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where this about my life growing up in the late 70s and, and how these songs kind of stick with the fabric of, of our time. You've done a lot of work with the Broadway Dreams Foundation. Tell me about that organization. Oh, it's a not-for-profit arts education foundation that I worked for for several years that we take Broadway actors, directors, choreographers to cities around the country and do arts education and training and then mentorship for young people that want to get into musical theater. It's been around for about 10 years, started by a dear friend of mine out of Atlanta, and I taught for them for two or three years, and then they asked me to become their artistic director which I did for four years, and I, I just recently stepped down last year, but hold them in the highest of regards and 
dear friends and amazing educators. Why do you think it works as successfully as it does? What is it bringing to the table nobody else is? Well, it is all people that are currently working in the business that are so passionate about it, you know, and then there are so many wonderful programs where kids can fly to New York and have that New York experience. This is about the people from Broadway going to Charlotte, North Carolina, to Dallas, to Omaha, Nebraska. And, you know, I didn't have that as a kid. I mean, I, I didn't have, I'd never met a Broadway person, you know, not even in college. So to have a team of six or seven or 10 sometimes come to my city and work with me and sing with me. And, and now with social media, the ability to stay in touch, it's really been pretty amazing. I mean, just to see the rewards of paying it forward. And, you know, like now I have students, ex-students that have more Broadway shows than I do, you know, so it's pretty fascinating. What artists influenced or inspired you? Oh gosh, so many. I mean, uh, I think so many of us uh, can relate. Like I grew up with my parents' record collection. That was a, a huge early influence. James Taylor, Carol King. The Beatles, Elton John, that's the foundation, you know, but then the, when I first started getting my own music was, I was still obviously drawn to Elton John, but I'll never forget like the first time I heard Maria Callas and Nina Simone, you know, when I was in high school. And that was something that I hadn't been exposed to before. So I love that both of those women are so different, but they both just left it all on the floor. You know, they just were raw. So I, people always say, what's your sound? I'm like, it's somewhere between Nina Simone, Maria Callas, and Elton John. Well, Billy, like, I, <laughs> Billy Bigelow certainly is that, because well, you do leave it all on yeah, the floor. Yeah. If you had to describe a great day, your idea of a great day, and I don't mean like, oh, on September 14th. I just think of a great day. What would it look like for you? A great day. Oh my gosh. Well, I love being outside. I love running. I love good food. <laughs> a good meal has got to be in there somewhere. A martini, some music, my boyfriend, my dog. I mean, that's that's about... That's good. Mine would definitely involve martini, dogs, dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, thank you so much. Thank I you really so appreciate much. It. That's Nicholas Rodriguez. He's playing the role of Billy Bigelow in Carousel at Arena Stage. It's running until December 24th. You can get more information at arenastage.org. After the holiday, you can catch Nicholas Rodriguez in Cabaret at the Signature Theater in Arlington, Virginia. Find out all about it at sigtheater.org. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.